good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for being here. But a special thank you for the hostless. The worst gig of the day after lunch. You've been fed, you've had a drink, you're relaxed, and you'll probably fall asleep. The only thing is, please don't snore, because it puts me off the presentation. <laughs> but for the rest of it, let's get started, because this morning was very interesting. True confidence, STCW doesn't cover what we've been talking about. Companies aren't ready because the developments we're going to have to make that our crews and our officers have to be better trained so that they are, have even more competence than what's needed. And part of the problem is a lot of people have been getting worried because we've started now in the last edition talking about crew competence. And we need competency certification. We need this, we need that, we need the other. No, we don't. It's always been there. We have certificates of competency. You do short courses. You're found to be competent. Uh oh, here we go. Lights going, head down. But see, there has always been awarded certificates. Sometimes I think we're going to have to increase the luggage allowance for seafarers because the size of the certificate file they have to carry now is getting bigger every year. <coughs> but this latest revision of the STCW convention is going to change things. There's more being put on. Yes, the colleges will train and do courses, but it's the onboard training, the in-house training by the company of the people to meet the demands. And we have to ask some quite difficult questions about how we're going to achieve this. And uh, I hope that over the next 10, 15 minutes, I dispel some of the problems. When we look at the competence tables in the new STCW in 2010, they put in an extra column. The knowledge is still the same, understanding, proficiency, but now the criteria for evaluation. And as you read through, you find more about uh, Going back to 1970 when I first went aboard the ship as a baby cadet, I had my cadet training book where I had to get all the tasks ticked off three times and after the third time it got ticked off for the fourth time so I could now work a boss's chair or I could splice a rope. And the part is though, if we're going to move into more of this of company training, onboard training, practical application instead of academic, who is going to do the work? It's going to be quite hard. So when I was going through, I thought one of the parts that's come up is we're talking now for basic and advanced training personnel and tankers for all types, which not really changed. There's a couple of parts to it. We'll talk about that later. The electrotechnical officers, because ships to advance in computing, electronics, even the electrical systems that we have. Some of these very large container ships, five, seven very large generators on board to cover the refrigerated cargoes. We have all that. And now we talk about the able seafarer deck and the able seafarer engine room. AB, oil and just changed, but they have the new uh, titles to them, and the training program and certification. <coughs> When I was looking to it, I thought, well, let's take this from uh, table 2-1. And it's actually quite something that's changing. And it brought home to me the changes in shipping, the training of our personnel. The column about plan, plan and conduct a passage. Celestial navigation. Celestial navigation appears on this table in table 2-2. Two, two. And the only other publication that deals directly with celestial navigation <coughs> is actually the Appendix B7 and the Bridge Procedures Guide, where it actually states about doing celestial navigation. It no longer appears in STCW Part A, Chapter 8. It doesn't appear in SOLAS, Chapter 5, Safety of Navigation. And so when you're working on board, so I do a lot of work on boards at navigation audits and other competency standards, that you're actually finding that the deck officers, especially younger deck officers, they've learned the theory. 
but they can't really apply it. Because one of the hardest questions to get is when you say, where's the sextant? And everybody starts looking at each other. Don't worry, I'm all for electronics, I'm all for moving ahead. But what happens if, say, the Americans, due to some crisis, decide to denigrate the GPS system right down? So you can't really use it safely for position fixing, for navigation. And people can't, can no longer have the skill to be very accurate using sites. It's a small point, it shows the evolution. Uh, when did the young gentleman and woman that I come across, GPS, they can make it sing, dance, do circles, amazingly. Art for radar, fantastic. Heck, this, brilliant. And that's it. That's where it stops. So we need to think about these things, how we're going to ensure that certain skills don't disappear, but we cannot live in the past. We have to move to now and in the future. <coughs> I mean, this is the time frame. We all know we're all sick of it. We know about it, about how we're going to come now from January. But we have a five-year period. The hardest part is going to be for new entrants trained to be officers. Okay, companies start from the 1st of January 2012. Are the training courses to the new syllabuses available, being verified and approved? Or are they going to have to wait to 2013 when they must be in place? And what happens to the intake to the maritime industry in between that time? Because we're going to have, like we had for the STCW 95 in the transitional phase, with people who had started on the old syllabuses that had to transfer to it. And we talk about when we come down the part for mandatory security training in accordance with the Manila Amendments. Shipboard security officer. But what about the company security officer? What about now when we're talking, I'm coming to later, about the training and qualifications of designated persons? STCW, where is the qualification, training and expectations for chief cooks? They don't exist because STCW, about watch keeping. We really need to amend the STCW to cover all aspects of training and qualification for people in the maritime industry, especially those related directly to working on the ships. We all talk about fatigue. How many of you here work the same hours as your crew if you're working in operations or technical in the office. There's no limitation in the hours of work you do per day or per week. <coughs> or being on call if you're a ship manager, if anything goes wrong you'll be called middle of the night. I remember years ago being a ship manager and at half past two in the morning the phone went, the wife hit me to wake me up, <laughs> got up and the captain said I've got a problem. Are you sinking? Oh. Is everybody dead? No. Good. Call me back in 10 minutes to get a coffee and get my brain started. So I got my coffee, sat down, and he called me back. I said, what's the problem that you have to call me at half past two in the morning? He says, well, you know how we were in West Africa? I said, uh-huh. Got some stowaways. I said, oh, can I? Whoa. I'm just sipping my coffee, and I said, and how many? 46. Oh, Jesus. Couldn't go back. Had to bring them with us. And I said, Do any of them speak English? No, we took care of them. We were on board. Nothing. Couldn't get anything out of any of them. And I said, okay, I'll see you. The ship's coming to Southampton. We'll try and get this sorted out to Southampton. Called the office, told them, P&I club and everything. These 46 gel. Very nice they're on board the ship and people are coming on board to Southampton and not a word, total silence and we're getting quite worried. But they knew, as soon as the first policeman stepped through the door to the crew mess room with the checkered <coughs> part his hat, they all shouted, political asylum! <laughs> that was us. They shouted at the front of the law, they now had to stay for three years of staying in the country at the ship owner's expense to process and do. So maybe this kind of things we have to move along with. But it's going to get harder. It's not going to get easier. As I come through this, there's so many changes. 
We're going to have to find new sources of crewing, new nationalities. Companies are going to have to diversify what's happening. So, the competence has been extended to a specialised training and tank personnel. <coughs> the focus is on outcomes of training, <coughs> reinforced by education, training, and seagoing service. Okay. The question now is, who conducts the onboard training? Is it one of the members of staff on board the ship? How do we regulate the work? If they're doing training, they're not doing their work. But under the hours of work and rest, every hour they spend doing training is part of their working hours for the day, <coughs> part of the working hours for the week. So we reduce them down. Can companies afford now to have specialised training officers to pay that will visit ships and sail with the ships for the training? I mean, I'm sure many of you at the moment are sitting and saying, hmm, and I just say the magic words, training for ECTUS, because the generic certification will not be enough. You have to have certification on the system you have on board. One of the companies that I deal with told me they had 16 different ECTUS manufacturers. 47. 47. See, he's always got to go one better. <laughs> he can't help himself. If I said 102, he would say 105. <laughs> but no, it's very complex. And think about the cost burden onto the ship and the company just to have the transition into ECTIS and having, not everybody will have the generic training certificate, but specific. And they could have crewing departments. You've got to be saying, oh, the second mate's unwell on this ship. We better send you. Oh, we've got a new second mate. We'll send him. No, we can't. Why not? He doesn't have the correct certification for the ECTUS system on board the ship. We've got to find somebody who matches, or they're going to have to go through the training again. It's going to be another complication to life. And we have, we have all this hours of work and rest, which we have. Do they contravene the requirements of watchkeeping? If you do the second mate, teaching cadets how to take sights or even do a passage plan. Is he keeping a lookout? Is he maintaining a safe navigational watch? Or is he doing another, he's not training very well and he's not doing the watch? Because training is not something that's haphazard. If you do it haphazardly, you get haphazard results if people are not trained properly. <coughs> or if he trains people badly, bad training it's worse than no training because people have been taught to do things wrongly. It takes a lot of time and effort to remove these bad practices that they've learned to make good practices. Uh, even computer based training systems. Be aware of the tanker operators. One of my clients last week, we had that we had cross side inspection. The ship had a high risk because they looked at a couple of the crew members. They'd be using the computer based training, and the interpretation by the Cyrus inspector was that that is work, it's nothing to do with safety, but it wasn't recorded in hours of work and rest of the week. But when you did add that, they were over the hours, so we broke in the legislation. To me, it's wrong. I totally disagree. The whole point of computer based training packages is they're available 24 7. People can fit them in their off duty hours so we're not using up the time off. They can suit themselves when to use it. But when you're doing safety training, and that's now being included as part of the working week, we have a problem. I just wanted to see how this pans out. Uh, we've written back to Sire about to say we don't agree with this. <coughs> we also talk about the training record books. Approved seagoing service and onboard training record books. Approved by the certificate issuing government. So, if you've got your own company training record book, you're going to have to send that to the flag state for each of your ships to get them to approve that it meets the standard that they want, or you're going to have to have the training record books from the flag states. Now, think about it how many cadets will you uh, train that through their training they will go onto the same ship as, or the same class of ship and they are all registered under the same flag? you end up with a bit of a problem matching everything up, especially when we're going through the A and C pair of deck and interim. 
and a new competence standards for tanker personnel. And these are coming in uh, to get the reduction of sea service. Part of it for me is, uh, if you want to be a tanker man, you can go and do the specialised tanker training course, five days, and you can go aboard a tanker as a supernumerary for 30 days. If you do three loadings and three discharges in 30 days, typical of a super tanker running between the Arabian Gulf and the Gulf of Mexico, uh, because you need that to get your endorsement. So, if you've only done 30 days, and after that, if you have your cheap base or master's license, you have your endorsement, how competent are you really to operate a large tanker, or even a smaller tanker, or a chemical tanker, or a gas carrier? The, the systems, the complexities of them now, you need more time to learn and grow as you become a deck officer and work your way up, you're learning more about the operations. You learn a lot of things that are not in the books. Uh, one of the things I learned way back in time was forget all the pump performance cars if you're using that as a cargo because it won't work, you'll just gas up. You have to change the way you operate the pump. It's not written down anywhere to get the cargo out. These are the things that only come through experience not by reading a book and filling out form. But we have the competence tables there, we'll work through with them and we'll take it easily. But we have to remember again, the STCW standard is not the highest pinnacle of achievement. It's the lowest standard that will be accepted for the issuance of certificates. That makes it a little bit different because as companies grow or they want to achieve excellence, which we talked about this morning, companies will have to demand more and add on to these courses and other things to meet the standard that the company requires. And one of the parts that this is going to come on to is about just culture, accountability, and about sustainability of companies. I won't bore you too much because I don't want to run on too late. Uh, Carry on. But we have the functions that are broken down the functions into seven parts. So you use the ones that are applicable to you, your deck officer, navigation, cargo, handling, stowage, <coughs> controlling of operations. If you're an engineer, marine engineer, electrical, electronic, and controlling <coughs> of A lot of the uh, five for the electrical side, that will probably be the electrotechnical officer if you're going to have one. And then maintenance repairs for everybody. And then of course you bring back radio communications, it goes back to the deck department. I always believe that at least one engineer on every ship should have a GMDSS certificate. Because you just never know, you could lose in a catastrophe all your deck officers. When they're gone, who's going to use the equipment? It's a thing that has to be done. It's an expense, there's other parts to it. But sometimes you have to think, as I say, in the ISM code, identify all risks. And we come through to these levels of responsibility, the management levels, about the master, the chief mate, chief and second year, your senior management team, and all the functions and responsibilities. Then we have the operational level, the officer in charge, navigational watch, or engineering watch, duty engineer. Three minutes? Oh my god, I better get going, right, okay. We won't bore you with that. We've done the tank a bit because I've talked about that before. The designated person. The I, ISM Code 2010 edition has in the appendices about designated persons and their training. And I've had some very interesting discussions about this. We have a lot of people who are designated persons have been doing the job. But we're going to have to relook at the qualifications they hold, show evidence, objective evidence of the training they've had and the updating of the knowledge training they have to go with the experience. And it's going to come on. And you're probably going to start next year when you're having the annual audit of the office. Somebody's going to come and ask you, the auditor, show me the file for the designated person and how they do the guidance requirements. And that's when people start saying, hmm. Because it's not a designated person having a team of people and the team has all the competence to show qualification, training, experience. The designated person must show how they need it. 
So the future, the certificate of seafarers is changing. There will be more and more requirements to have additional certification to sail and operate certain ship types. Companies will become involved in the training of crews and requirements of an onboard training expands, and it will do. Retention of crew will become more important as investment in training and certification increases. Tanker systems we already have with sign and CDI on the part of crew management. Retention of crew, uh, continuity of service and ship types, etc. But it's going to spread through every ship type and keeping crew members because as the demand becomes and we have not enough seafarers to go out, they will go to where they think they're getting the best package. And we also have new sources of crew to cover the shortfall in numbers. Who knows, we might suddenly get out of Mongolia offering special packages, a full master to date point through, trained in outer Mongolia to serve aboard the ships. Two year contract at low cost. All sources of crew will reduce because we're suffering in India already the change, the economic climate, the rise in standard of living. A lot of young people who used to go to sea will go work in IT in India to get a similar package. And the final part will be the maritime colleges are going to have to adapt to meet the demands, integration of onboard training with the college. Companies will need to develop trainers and instructors who can deliver the required support. It can no longer be, you're a captain or you're a chief engineer, you'll do the training. The old uh, train the trainer course of line will be so far out of date now it can't be done. And shipboard serving officers are used to deliver the prime employment and training duties without compromising hours of work to rest. And in this time of austerity, it is difficult to find the resources for increasing the numbers of boards. But what are the options? I wish I could tell you the answer. Hard times are ahead, probably harder than they are now, but we're going to have to adapt and find solutions to continue, especially in light of all this morning's presentations EEDI, SEPs, and everything else, green certification, it's all coming. How do we meet it? Thank you very much.